All right, this evening we're going to try to gain some more wisdom from the book of Proverbs. And there's another subject that's been on my heart a little bit and something that I think is really important to teach on. And uh, it's the, the topic of friendship and specifically the title of my sermon is a faithful friend. Faithful friend. Uh, friendships are really important. You know, we ought to be forming friendships with people and, um, you know, being a good friend is really important. We need friends in our life. We're going to see from the scripture the importance of friends. And, um, you know, oftentimes a friend can be better to you than even family members. And again, we'll look at all that in scripture, but um, it is important that you can be a faithful friend. Um, you know, and, and part of being faithful is to be truly loving whoever it is that you choose to be friends with. And um, sometimes that means that you have to do things that are unpleasant in the friendship because you actually do truly care about the friendship. Look at verse number five there in chapter 27. The Bible says, open rebuke is better than secret love, right? So, uh, so if someone loves you secretly, it doesn't really do much for you, right? You can love someone secretly, but like, if it's secret, it's not outward. There's nothing being expressed. There's nothing being shown. There's nothing really being done for that love. But an open rebuke, does do something, right? Because if you're in an area where you need to be corrected and you receive an open rebuke, that's a great opportunity then to get right. So be able to receive correction. Someone, uh, the Bible says there in verse number six, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So sometimes you can, you can receive a wound, as it were, from a friend but that's actually a faithful thing. That's actually a good thing. Whereas you can receive kisses, but if it's from an enemy, it's deceitful, right? Like we all think, hey, wounds are bad. I don't want a wound. Kisses are good, right? Let's receive kisses. But yeah, not the kisses from an enemy, right? And that's, and that's what enemies will do. Enemies will oftentimes try to butter you up and try to sweet talk you. And this is what you want to be really careful, even when you're just choosing your friends to people you want to be friends with. Watch out for people that are just kind of going a little over the top and and flattering you with their mouth and telling you how great you are and this and that, it's a red flag. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 19, you don't have to turn there, the Bible says, He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets, therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Right? And if you want a faithful friend, hey, this guy that's going about as a talebearer revealing secrets, he says, then it says, therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Right? So people who are just going out of their way, to make sure that they're going to, you know, lift you up and praise you and do all these other things and just provide flattery. Those people don't have good intent. It is a very big red flag. So, you know, the kisses of an enemy, yeah, someone can be trying to treat you all real nice and real good, but if they're actually an enemy, that's not good for you, right? Because they're going to just be trying to hurt you in the end. The enemy's not looking to do you good. But you can have a friend, if they're truly a friend, if they actually do care about you, but then they do things or say things that might seem to be like a wound, well, hey, that's still faithful because the whole point is they're, if, they're your, if they're your friend, it's still going to be for your benefit. And we got to think about it like things like this. You know, if you truly love somebody, for example, if you have a family member that you know isn't saved, you could talk all day long about how much you love that person, but if you actually don't like confront them and like, try to show them how to be saved, show them their error, show them the truth of the gospel. How much can you say you really love them? Now, there's always a risk when doing that because you're worried about someone not wanting to then talk to you anymore because you bring that up or because you bring up this hard truth. And the same goes for friendships, right? That's obviously the gospel's a real easy example. We could all understand that. We all see the value. We could all see that, yes, absolutely, I love this person. I want them to have eternal life. I want them to be saved. I don't want them to go to hell. Really clear picture, right? That's real easy to understand. But sometimes with friendships, though, we, we, we're faced with different situations, right? It's not a heaven and a hell thing because our friends really ought to be saved people already anyways, right? That's, that's who your good friend should be. That's who your best friend should be. You have acquaintances out in the world. That's fine, whatever, right? We work, we do other things. You can talk to people here and there. But who you make and decide to be your friends, you know, they ought to be Christians. They ought to be brothers, or sisters, right? Whoever it is, it's just your friendship should be people who are children of God and people that you would love enough to be willing to 
when, it, when time requires to be able to make a rebuke or to say something that you know may not even go over very well. But you do it because you actually do care about them and you don't want to just pat them on the back and tell them everything's good and, hey, I love you and I support you. But, like, no, if you've got a big, serious problem, it's got to be taken care of. Now, obviously, we have to have discernment when we're deciding whether or not someone needs a rebuke, a friend needs a rebuke, because... You know, on, on the one hand, you can be this holier-than-thou person that just, like, wants to point out everybody's little flaws and tell everybody what they're doing wrong or tell your friend, you know, every time you talk to your friend, if you've got something you need to nitpick on them, that's not faithful wounds of a friend. <laughs> okay, that's, that needs some introspection to see whether or not you're being a jerk, right, and that you're just being hypercritical of someone. But on the flip side, right, if you have a friend and you can see them going down a path and you can see that there's a problem, you can see there's error, why wouldn't you say something to them, right? A faithful friend should do that 100%. You should absolutely do that. But I will give this warning more further in, in verse number 14, though, about, about kind of a fake friend. He that blesseth his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning, the Bible says it should be counted a curse to him. And this is someone who's just, you know, they're being real loud on purpose. Why? Because they want to have other people hear how great they are about talking about this other guy. Right, just getting on this megaphone here would be like, you know, maybe social media, just kind of like, hey, hey, everybody, look at how great I'm being to this person or whatever. And it's just so that they can look good. It's just like the, the, the Pharisees or whoever that were going to give their money and just make sure you announce it before everyone. The charity does this, you know, the Bill and, Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, you know, we're going to announce how great we are and how many people we're helping and broadcast it to the world, right? That's a fake charity. There's no real love there. They're doing it for their own gain, their own benefit. Same thing happens with, uh, with people who are conducting themselves like this. It's real similar to flattery. Jump, or look over here at verse number 9 in chapter 27. The Bible says, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. So just like ointment and perfume is, you know, it's something that's enjoyable, it's good, people like it in general. Um, the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. So there's receiving that good advice, getting good advice from a friend um, is just as valuable or as, as enjoyable as the ointment and perfume is being uh, likened to. Verse number 10, thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. And that's a, you know, another reason it's good to have friends and friends that are close to you, especially, especially when you have family that are far away from you. Hey, make some good friends. Make sure you've got some good, godly friends close to you that, you know, God forbid you ever get into a time of need. Hey, you have somebody there. You don't have to run off to be with family. You could be with people who are friends. And, you know, to have friends like that, well, you need to be a friend like that. You know, you, you need to make sure that you're there for people just as much as you would want them to be there for you, right? So that's, you know, an application for yourself is just like, well, hey, how can I be a better friend to people, right? We all want to have friends like this where I could say, yeah, I know I can rely on this person or this person or this person, to receive me into their house or to help me when I have a time of need or whatever, well then, if I want that to be the case in my life, then I'm going to be going out and making sure that I'm that way towards them. I mean, it's real simple. That's one of the basic fundamental truths of the scripture, right? With, with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And, and just, just overall, the, you, know, you reap what you sow and the, and the way that you uh, treat, you know, want to be treated is the way you should treat other people. Like this is, this is just real simple stuff. But we ought to remind ourselves of that from time to time so we can make sure we are being good friends and not just totally slacking on, you know, being a good friend to people when they need it. Verse number 17 here, Proverbs 27 has so much on friendship just in general. It's a great chapter. The Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. And that sharpening the countenance, it's, it's sharpening the face, right? It's, it's improving them, it's, it's helping them. And the countenance is your face, it's your, it's your image. So um, just as iron can sharpen iron, um, a man should be improving and helping, you know, 
bring a smile to your friend's face. How about that? You know, do something good for them and uh, something to help your friend out. Now, as I mentioned before, and where I'm, the, the main thrust of this sermon is being a faithful friend, because that, that word faithful is coming specifically from faithful are the wounds of a friend, right? So being faithful in all, in all manners, of course, be faithful in the, all the good, in all of the, the, the being there for them, being loyal to your friend, standing up for your friend, not allowing, you know, evil to be spoken of your friend and bad things, you know, whatever, but at the same time, being able to uh, step in and offer that rebuke when it's necessary. And, you know, one of the main reasons why people don't do this is because they are worried of offending their friend just as much as people are worried about offending their family members when uh, wanting to give them the gospel. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs eighteen nineteen says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. So when you offend a brother, it, it, that can be really hard to recover from that situation. But, you know, as believers, we ought not to be easily offended, right? So personally, you never can control how someone else is going to respond, but we ought to make sure if, if we have a brother, if we have a friend that is, you know, wounding us, that we know how to respond to that as well, that we wouldn't get offended um, even though they might. Proverbs 9, verse number 6, the Bible reads, Forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. So it's, the Bible is clear about just reproving in general, that like you don't just reprove anyone. Right? You ought to be able to reprove people who can receive it because if you're reproving someone who's scornful or a scorner, then they are just going to hate you. Right? And if you already know the outcome of it, then what's the point kind of, right? Like it's, hey, you reprove the scorner, they're going to hate you. But then it says this, Re rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. And I think we all want to be wise, right? So we ought to be open to receiving correction, receiving rebuke. Because if you really do care about the truth, if you really care about being right, if, you, if these things matter to you, if you want to be right with God and someone comes up to you and a friend especially comes up to you and is going to provide a rebuke for you, you know, initially most of us would probably want to go on the defensive because you feel like you're being attacked. Right? That's another reason why I think this is faithful are the wounds of a friend. It feels like it hurts. It feels like it stings. It feels like you're being attacked. And you may want to attack back right, or say something back. We ought to, one, refrain ourselves. And this goes a little bit to what I was preaching this morning. You know, just having that temperance and control. We ought to be able to be mindful enough to not just give knee-jerk responses when people say or do things that we don't like. We ought to be able to receive it, take it. We ought to be slow to speak and slow to wrath, as the Bible says, and quick to hear, right? So we're, we're ready to hear, but then when it's time to respond, we should absorb what we're hearing and be able to receive it. And no one likes being told they're wrong. Nobody does. I don't like being told I'm wrong. You probably don't like being told you're wrong because we like being right, <laughs> right? It feels good to be right. I want to be right. So when you're wrong, Oftentimes, you don't realize that you're wrong either, which is another hard thing to deal with. Now, sometimes you do, and when you already know you're wrong, usually it's easier to receive the rebuke because you're just going like, okay, yeah, I already knew that. I, I really um, need to fix that or work on that or whatever. But when things might come as a shock to you, you think like, no, I'm not doing anything wrong, and then someone has to come and tell you, like, no, actually, you, you, know, you are. This, is, this isn't right. You need to fix that. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't always take well, but if you're wise, you'll love the person that rebukes you. Now, this is also important to understand, too. I would say this. Even if the person who's rebuking you is wrong and they don't have, you know, the, the, their reasoning for rebuking you is incorrect. It's like maybe factually incorrect or just... Just not right. 
But if you could look at that person and be like, yeah, but this is my friend who's trying to offer a correction to me, even though they know, you know, like, like you ought to be able to, to recognize that your friend does care about you and is trying to help you instead of blasting them and shunning them and getting rid of them or whatever, right? The appropriate response for a wise man, even if you think that that person's wrong and say, hey, you know what? I still appreciate that you're willing to tell me something that you think is wrong about me, that you think that I'm doing wrong. And that, that is an, an attitude that's a humble attitude that we need to maintain because the more full of yourself you are, the more you're going to think you don't do anything wrong, right? And the harder it's going to be to receive rebuke. So we should love the person who rebukes us because one, if they're right, we need to get right anyways. And we all want to get better with the Lord. But if, we're, if even if they're wrong, even if you disagree with the rebuke and say, you know what, that's not really the situation. You're not really right about that. You still should love that friend because of their willingness to say something. Like that's just the right thing to do. It's a way to be a good, faithful friend. The Bible says in verse 9, give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase learning. So it's only good to receive instruction, to be able to receive rebukes, to be able to receive these teachings, right? Because it's just going to help us to grow and get better. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 23, he that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. So, yeah, of course, because after the fact, right? At first, the rebuke doesn't feel good. It kind of stings. And at first, the flattery may feel good, right? But in the end, the flatterer is out to deceive you and out to trick you. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And the person who's rebuking you is actually seeking your benefit. So the, it's, it's the end of the matter, not the beginning, right? And that's why the, 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 he that rebukes will find more favor in, in the end, afterwards. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse number 4, the Bible reads, The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. And this is, this is a truth that's found more so in Ecclesiastes, but also even Jesus talks about this. You know, the heart, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. It's kind of like the more wisdom you get, you, you kind of experience or see more grief. The more you learn about like, just the truth and what's right and righteousness, the more you kind of see the wickedness of, of people in the world and just kind of how bad things really are, right? Like, like people have this concept of, of eh, I'm not that bad and stuff. Like, I think I'm pretty good. And then like, you start reading and you're just like, man, you know, this is, worse, this is worse than I thought it was, right? And you even see this in stories with the kings in the Bible. Like, the Bible's been gone for a while. No one's really been preaching it. And then, like, when Josiah got it out and was just, you know, the, the, the book of the law was read before him, he's just like, wow. Like, our fathers really dropped the ball here. We got we to gotta cha we, we change a lot, man. Let's get back to serving the Lord. But at the time, he didn't think there was much wrong. He's like, yeah, let's repair the house of the Lord. Let's do the, you know, he's just trying to do, like, these good things. And then it just, like, bang, hits him. Why? Because he, he started gaining wisdom. He started hearing the word of God. It's just like... No, man, there's, it's, it's way worse. So the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, right? It's just kind of sadness, there's grief to it. But the heart of fools is in the house of mirth, right? So the fools go out, yeah, let's party it up and let's, you know, have this good time and, and who cares and, and whatever, right? And just kind of have this va vain life, just the house of mirth, just pleasure, enjoyment, whatever. But... The Bible says it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise. So the guys that are spending their time more in the house of mourning than it is to hear the song of fools, right? And just go along with the foolishness and whatever, because that's all vanity anyways. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus chapter number 19. Leviticus chapter 19. I'm just going to read briefly from Luke 17 for you. As you go to Leviticus 19... Leviticus 17.3, or excuse me, Luke 17.3. You're going to Leviticus 19. Luke 17.3, the 
Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. So, you know, and this is specifically this situation. If your brother trespasses against you, right? You got a problem. Someone does you wrong. Jesus says, well, then rebuke him, right? Tell him he's wrong. <laughs> Tell him what he did wrong to you. And, and look, I, I'm a strong believer in this. If, you have, if someone does you wrong, you've got two choices. One is just forgive and forget, right? Be done with it. You don't even have to bring it up. It doesn't have to be a thing. But if you choose that option, make sure that that isn't a thing. Because if it's going to be a root of bitterness, if it's going to be this thing that just stays in your mind, that you don't bring it up, but it's just always there and you're kind of harboring resentment towards someone, it's better than just bring it up. You got a problem with someone? They did you wrong? Just face them. Just confront them. And look, I know that's an issue, especially as we continue into the future in the society with people in the generations that come that are just terrified of like human interaction. Okay, and no, if someone does you wrong, don't text them they did you wrong. Don't even call them and, you know, confront them. Like, talk to them face to face. It's not really that scary. And if it is, you gotta, you gotta actually just push yourself out there to do it and just say, hey, you did me wrong. Look, if someone did you wrong, there's nothing wrong with you just saying, you did wrong, right? Rebuke him. And Jesus said, and if he repent, then you forgive him. So if he's like, yeah, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. You're right. That's enough. And then you could say, okay, now, now you forgive him. And now you let it go, right? But it's, you know, it gives you that peace of mind anyways. If someone does do you wrong, you'll be able to bring it up. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing unchristian about bringing something up that someone did you wrong. But if he repents, forgive him. Amen. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, again, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And this is a good, obviously, this is talking about your brother, right? Brother or sister in Christ. But we should apply this just as well to friendship. Right? Someone does you wrong. Hey, tell them they did you wrong. But then they repent, then great. Forgive them. Keep moving forward. Leviticus 19, we actually, get, we actually get some really good wisdom from this chapter about rebuking friends and shows that it's actually an act of love. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. So it doesn't matter what status they have, how much money they have, right? Our all judgment should be righteous judgment. And nothing else should, you know, nothing should come into play of like, you know, how much money, whatever status they have. Hey, every single time a judgment should be made righteously. Verse number 16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people, neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. And Again, you know, n none of these things are in here by coincidence. It's all in an order here, I believe, for very good reason. You know, when you um, are doing judgment, you also don't just have to go running around and telling a bunch of stories. Right? That's, there's nothing profitable to that. And uh, the Bible is clearly commanding you not to do that. Verse 17, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. And that command we see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Right? Look at the book of 1 John, for example. Not, you know, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So as I saying, not to allow your neighbor to get into sin. Right? Not to allow, and the way that they're doing this here, your brother to get into sin. It's using brother and neighbor interchangeably here in this passage. So your brother, your neighbor, right? Like, don't suffer them. Don't suffer sin upon them. Don't allow them to be getting themselves into sin. So how do you do that? You rebuke. You give a rebuke. Verse number 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So again, as you continue in through the judgment here, you don't need to be the one to avenge. 
you rebuke the neighbor, but you don't take vengeance into your hand to then go and, and you know, do some retribution against them or something because they did you wrong. No. I don't need to avenge, and you don't have to bear a grudge against the children of God, right? The children of thy people. And this is important also. When people do wrong, you know, hey, there is sometimes if it's a church setting, there might be church discipline that's appropriate. There may be cutting fellowship with people or whatever, but you don't need to bear a grudge, right? We're going to do things properly. We ought to be living our lives in a way where we could look at the Bible and say, I am going to behave this way. I'm going to act the way that God wants me to act. And when it comes to rebukes, if I need to rebuke a friend, then I'm going to rebuke my friend. If it's uncomfortable, it is what it is. But I, if I love that person, I'm going to give them a rebuke. And maybe they're not repentant. Maybe they don't care. Maybe they think there's nothing wrong. Hey, fine. But if they're, if they're doing something wicked enough, you just got to be like, well, then I'm going to break fellowship from you. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. And, but the, I'm not going to be holding a grudge. Right? No one should be holding a grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. And you got to treat this as, and we should always be doing this, when, especially when it comes to judgments, when it comes to rebukes and all these things. How would I want someone to treat me? So thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Well, what does it mean? Hey, if I'm wrong, if I'm in sin, I would want someone to tell me that I'm wrong. Right? And this is, I'm just speaking for me personally. So like, if I'm doing something, if, I, if I'm engaged in some activity, I'm engaged in some sin, I would like to know that I'm doing something wrong. But if I'm not, then I don't really want to hear it. <laughs> but if I'm not and someone does bring it to me, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to show grace because if I'm ever wrong about judging someone else, I wouldn't want that to destroy my friendship, so I would give the same grace that I would expect. Does that make sense? Let's see here. I'm just looking at the time. Tonight's, the, this evening's sermon isn't going to be as, as lengthy as this morning's was, so we're going to let you out a little bit earlier Turn, if you would, to turn you would to Second Timothy chapter four. When it comes to faithful friends and being a faithful friend, the good thing is, is that even when it seems like no one may end up standing with you, we can always have, be sure that God is with us, especially if you're righteous in your cause. Right? When you're right, even if everyone drops you, if something comes out, because let's face it, I'm sure there's been plenty of people who have been smeared wrongfully, Right? And sometimes accusations can sound really horrible, right? And that, but once the accusation's out there, you have a lot of people that might want to go like, I don't want anything to do with, you know, like, like that's a really bad accusation. And especially if it's, you know, if it's true, then yeah, no one would want to be around you, depending, you know, if it's a real severe thing, right? I'm thinking like some of the worst of the worst, right? Some child predator or something like that. Someone accuses you of something like that. You could understand why people might want to distance if, if that accusation even just gets thrown out there. Well, you got to understand, you wouldn't want that to happen if they're your friend. They should be able to realize, like, yeah, they would never do that. But if that ever, something like that would ever come up, you could understand, hey, but even if no man is going to stand with you, we can still have comfort in the fact that the Lord will be there for you. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 16. The Bible says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Okay, this is the Apostle Paul. And he's saying, look, no one was standing with me. Everybody forsook me. But look at how he responded to that. 
I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. So even if you're right in your cause, and even if everybody's walking away from you, and everybody's forsaking you, and you didn't do anything wrong, the right response, the godly response is to still be forgiving of those people and just say, God, don't, lay, don't blame them. Don't blame them. Right? God's still there. And look at what it says in verse 17. Not with saying the Lord stood with me. Because at the end of the day, that's really what matters the most. Because you could be doing right and everyone else could be wrong. And if God's with you, then it doesn't matter who is on the other side, as it were. That means nothing. Right? I got God on my side. <laughs> you could either come on God's side or not, but I'm going to stay here with God. Right? Like that's, that's how we all ought to be. But as human beings, it's hard. Right? It's real difficult when you've got a bunch of friends and people you know, just backing away and not wanting anything to do with you. That's a hard thing to deal with. But when you have the humble mindset and one that you, know, you can see, you could be reasonable and say, you know what, God, don't, you know, don't lay that to their charge as a sin against them. Still, um, yeah, I mean, just it is what it is. Look at verse 17 again. Now I was saying the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And, you know, when he said I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, you can take that how you will, but to me it, it almost reads like it's, he's talking about like the devil, right? Because the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And these attacks that the Apostle Paul was facing, I'm sure he's faced plenty of attacks from the devil. And, um, you know, whether it's a, a literal lion or not, hey, God delivered him out of his troubles even when no one stood with him. And um, God was there for him. So, hey, to God be the glory. And when, and when we're willing to sacrifice ourselves and, and put ourselves out there for the Lord, and, and especially in the ministry, everything ought to be done for the glory of God's sake. And when you're out there, even if no one stands with you, hey, if it's for God's sake, he's there with you. Galatians 4 is the last place I want to look at, and we're dismissed. Galatians chapter 4. And the Apostle Paul is a great example of all of these things. There's so much depth to the, the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So many things to learn. In fact, I, I, I'm just now I'm thinking, man, I need to write this down because I should do a whole series on the life of the Apostle Paul. There's so many things to learn from him from the time that he was against the church, against the things of God, and getting saved, and then doing all these great works for the Lord. And I mean, just, just so much here. And now even seeing how he's dealing with all of these different churches, getting church plants started, doing this great work, doing missionary work. He's got many times, not just that one in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where he says, no man stood with me, but then other instances too where, where people are forsaking him and other people are going and doing this. And, and you know, he, he runs into all these problems and issues and stuff, but yet remains faithful and yet remains true to the cause. When everyone else may fail around you, he stuck with it, and he stayed true. And he wasn't afraid to give rebukes when needed either. You could read like First and Second Corinthians, for example. There's a lot of rebukes to the churches there. They needed to be corrected. They needed to be improved, and he's giving that to them. Obviously, it's the word of God, but he's also willing and ready to deliver those words. And even when he was saying, you know, hey, should I come to you in love or with the rod? Right? And again, you know, to the soul morning sermon, I don't think it was a little rod. I think it's just his manner of speech and how he was coming. He would come, you know, rebuking and being angry with them, or is he going to come in love, right? So um, and it's all going to be a matter of how they receive the word of God. But look at Galatians chapter 4, verse number 13. The Bible says, Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. In my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected but received me as an angel of God, even as, Je as Christ Jesus. So if, if you, in case you don't know, the church of Galatia, they were getting wrapped up in this really bad, damnable heresy where, someone, where people were trying to add circumcision to salvation. Like, no, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised, right? And, and they're adding this works, this total perversion of the gospel, false gospel, and he's dealing with that head on, and that's pretty much what the whole book is about like he's just really addressing that issue and hammering that home and 
we're at the point now where he's saying, you know how I came to you at first, right? Because he's the one that helped establish the church there. He was the one doing the soul winning with other, you know, with other disciples. Stuff. But out there doing the work, you know how even in the infirmity of my flesh, I preached the gospel to you. I told you the truth. And, if, and he had some physical fleshly thorn in his flesh that was a trouble to him, that was bothering him, right? And I think it has to do with his eyes, but that's neither here nor there for the sermon. And he says, in my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not. It didn't bother you. It didn't make you reject my message because I'm dealing with this thing. I mean, I don't know, maybe he had some kind of festering, pussing thing, and it was just kind of like off-putting to even look at. I don't know. But he's bringing it up saying, you didn't despise that, that I had this issue, that I had this problem, but you still received me. He says, uh, you didn't reject me, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Like you were totally open and welcoming to hear the message, to hear what I had to say. You received me. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And this is one of the reasons why I think he had a problem with his eye, because he's saying like they were willing to sacrifice of themselves. Give me your eyes, Right. So that's the spirit. That's the attitude that the church of Galatia had when he first went there. But what happened? Things have changed. Why? Because people have crept in. Because these false brethren have crept in with this damnable heresy and this damnable doctrine trying to, to add works to salvation to now they're even doubting of the apostle Paul. He's like, I'm the one who brought this to you. I'm the one who brought you salvation to the point where he's even like, I stand in doubt of you. He was standing in doubt of their own salvation. But look at verse number 16 here. He says, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The Apostle Paul was willing to tell him the truth. And he's willing to bring a rebuke and tell him, no, you're wrong. You need to get this right. This is not right at all. You're being deceived. This is... But he's, he's at the point now where he's saying, like, are you going to treat me as an enemy now? Really? Me? You received me well? You were my friend? You would do anything for me? But now because I'm telling you the truth? Now I'm your enemy? What happened? We don't want to be friends like that. Don't be a friend like that to someone else. If, they, if they're sincerely trying to... Because look, our loyalties at the end of the day lie with Jesus Christ. Amen. So if we have issue with another brother or sister in Christ, but because of your loyalty to Christ and your... And your conscience to the word of God, if that makes you to have to give a rebuke, if that forces you to have to say something because you love this person, hey, and if someone does that to you, you don't have to treat that person as your enemy. We ought not to. That's not the godly response. You don't have to make them your enemy. You can, you can not receive what they're saying while at the same time appreciating, hey, I at least understand where you're coming from. We ought to be faithful friends, faithful to the point of being able to say things that may not be received well, but more important than being even as a faithful friend is being faithful to the Lord. Don't ever let your friendship trump what your faith is and what you believe about the Bible and what's right and what's wrong. You can't ever do that. You don't want to get on the wrong side of things for a man as opposed to just being on the right side of God. And look, I get it. There's going to be disagreements. There's always disagreements. There's people disagree about doctrines. There's people disagree about all kinds of different things, right? But we ought to love the brethren. We're, we're commanded to not hate our brother or sister in Christ ever. There should never be hatred in your heart for another brother, Amen. ever. That's totally wrong. No matter what you feel about, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be like just best friends with everybody, but, but look, you, you really ought to make sure that you still love the brethren and do your best to be the best Christian that you can and still, hey, even if you're rejected, have the right attitude. Hey, God, don't lay this to their charge. I can deal with it. Hey, they forsook me, fine. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with it the right way. So in all, in all aspects, we, we, we need to strive. We need to try to do what's right. 
and for the right reasons, and ultimately let this be the bar, let this be the truth, and if you stick with this, you won't go wrong. Amen. You won't. Friendships may come and go, it happens as part of life, right? But hopefully they come back, even when things don't go well, that there could become a point where friendship's restored, things are great, amen, right? But if not, you got to go with the conscience and what the scripture says. And if not, still, okay, well, I'm not going to hate you and I'm not going to, you know, do anything to hurt you. Just, I'm not going to take vengeance if someone did me wrong, you know, like, well, you hurt me. Fine, you know, God could deal with that. I'm just going to let the Lord deal with it. As far as I have a word of prayer, dear Lord. Thank you so much for the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs and elsewhere in the scripture, Lord. I pray that you please help us all to be good friends, to be faithful friends, dear Lord, and um, not fickle and not um, just dropping people at, a, at the drop of a hat, but um, Lord, help us to do the hard job when it's necessary, when we think there is a reason for it to, to be able to provide a rebuke because we love our friends and we want to try to help them and, and show them the error of their way. I pray that you please help us to always be considerate of, you know, loving our neighbors ourselves. that we would consider how would we want to be treated if we were happen to be in the same situation that uh, our friend were, Lord, that we would be able to do things appropriately and do things righteously, dear God. And I pray that you would please just, uh, just help us in this endeavor. Lord, give us the wisdom that we need. Give us the discretion. Help us to, to do things right. We're all imperfect. We don't always do things uh, completely correct, dear Lord, but you can see our heart. And I pray that you would please just guide us in the right path. And Lord, ultimately, um, that we could be good friends uh, to others. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.